Hi, this is Paul. It's time to make a video. Yesterday, Esther O'Reilly put out uh, on her blog uh, retrospective a bit. A year ago, she started writing about Jordan Peterson, and I thought it was a good rep retrospective in terms of five lessons Jordan Peterson has taught the church. And someone had a meme of Dwight from the office saying, "No, the church never learns this fast." <laughs> I thought that was a, I thought it was a terrific meme, but it's a it's a good piece by by Esther, and it's 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 prompted me to do a little bit of retrospection. Uh, in May 2018, Malthy Buddha did what I thought was a good video, especially the first part. The first few minutes are devastating in terms of taking some bits from Sam Harrison, some bits from Jordan Peterson, and it just, I think, illustrates well in those first few minutes where, how we've gotten here. And over the last few weeks, talking to James Lindsay and, uh, and, James Lindsay, who's who's part of the faction of celebrity atheists with Peter Bogosian, I, I didn't realize the deep connection that the Jordan Peterson movement had from the Sam Harris movement. And the more I talk to individuals, again, you can find all the conversations on my channel, and, and the conversations I post are only a sampling of all the conversations I have, especially things in the comment section, private email sent to me, messages on Twitter, so on and so forth. A uh, conversation I had yesterday, which may or may not get posted, depends on after I have a conversation with someone, I'll usually send it to them and say, you watch it and you decide after thinking about it whether or not you want me to post it because there is hazard in posting these things. We all have reputations. Many people have jobs, careers to think about, families to think about, so they don't necessarily want everything posted. But the the journey through Sam Harris to Jordan Peterson is is a significant piece of this. For me, though, you know, Jordan Peterson got my attention by his calm demeanor in the face of some outraged students. That caught my attention, and, and he was. I, I then I began to read the comment section and began noticing he was doing some things that I didn't see the church doing. the The road to Sam Harris seemed to be a one way street, and I saw Jordan Peterson. I saw people following Jordan Peterson coming back down that road, and I thought, "This is a this is a new thing. This is a this is a burning bush of sorts." And and I noticed right away that he was that Peterson is trying to to reconnect the split world. For a number of years before that, I was I was wrestling with what it means to preach to people who on Sunday morning come into a church and listen to stories from Genesis about a man and a woman in a garden and they you know the the Genesis 1 representation if you find videos before I started making some of these videos the Genesis 1 representation of this this flat earth and a dome just just read Genesis 1 and read it in the King James version before later later translations try to nuance it so as not to upset Christians read it in the King James version in terms of what the cosmology looks like in Genesis 1. And and here is Peterson, and he, in a sense, for, for, for people who have, you know, who have gone whole hog with Sam Harris, he is bringing them back to the Bible. And I watched that, and I thought, that's some, that's some serious stuff. I've seen evangelical apologists trying every which way but you know all kinds of ways to to get people off there and, and I've, I've i've heard this for years and here's peterson this this guy out of university of toronto who's whose relationship to to church and traditional christianity is is complex at best bringing these people to a point where they're seriously interested in the Bible and in church. And and it, initially, I didn't appreciate the nihilism and the depression that was so prevalent within the Sam Harris tribe and, and noticing how desperate many individuals have become for meaning in their lives. And, and so here, here's Peterson, and and he's doing it. And I thought, I, I've got to, I've got to figure out what he's doing. I want to learn from him. I want to be able to do this too. So maybe I'm, for those of you who know your Bible real well, maybe I'm like Simon Magnus looking at the Apostle Peter, saying, Oh, I've, I've got to, I, I, I want to figure out how you're doing this, Jordan. And so, of course, in order to do this, 
Um, I'd better I'd better study him, and I I wanted to. I've spent the last well, it'll be two years this May since I started watching his videos, just just doing deep dives into him and reading the people that he's read and and reading almost everything that's been written about him because I I want to figure out how this movement has come about following him. Now, I'm a huge Tolkien fan, and one person put in a comment in a recent video, not enough Tolkien references, so here's your, here's your obligatory Tolkien reference in this video. Uh, in The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, of course, loved these little songs and poems that he would put in his book, especially The Hobbit. There's lots of silly ones there, because it's a children's book, but there's more serious ones in The Lord of the Rings. The road goes ever on and on, down from the road where it goes. Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with weary feet, until it joins some larger way, where many paths and errands meet, whither then I cannot say. Um, yeah, 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 the road goes on, and, and this road has brought me to some places I had not anticipated. Um, it's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. Bilbo used to say, you step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. Do you realize that this is the very path that goes through Mirkwood, and that if you let it, it might take you to the Lonely Mountain, or even further, to worse places? He used to say that on the path outside the front door of Bag End, especially after he had been out for a long walk. So the I almost always read way too many books at once, and... I've been paying a lot of attention to attention lately and relevance because, again, I'm through this process. I'm trying to figure out how my crazy head works. And in many ways, what my videos are are just a slightly more organized mental rambling than the mental rambling that goes on in my head all day long as I read things and and write things and talk to people and so on and so forth. That's that's all these videos are. This is a this is the record of this little, tiny little chapter of my thought life. And, and so I read way too many books at once, and then usually what happens is I'm reading four, five, six books, and, and one book, one, I keep starting new books, which means I keep kind of dropping old books, which I'll probably pick up at some point. And then usually what happens is one book hooks me. And, and the book that's hooked me lately is is How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. And, and so here I am, I, I don't, I, I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke tobacco. I don't smoke weed. I'm, you know, I'm a Puritan when it comes to these kinds of things. And here I'm reading this crazy book on psychedelics. And, and after the video I made about psychedelics, I'm getting a lot of really interesting comments and emails from many of you. And I, I really appreciate it, set, uh, sharing your experiences with me. And I got a very thoughtful one yesterday from a from a Christian who was telling me that, that this person had um, had gotten into psychedelics and and had a couple of experiences, and they can't talk about it in in a Christian context, in an evangelical context, for for all the obvious reasons. And you know, me with my high openness, my my rule of thumb, thumb as a pastor tends to be: I'd rather hear something heterodox or or crazy or terrible from you if it's honest than 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 not so that that tends to be my rule so I, I deeply appreciated his sharing his experience with me and the difficulty of talking about these things within an evangelical context and so i'm reading i'm reading michael poland's book and and just learning a ton from it and and enjoying what a what a what a terrific writer i never read the omnivore's dilemma so i don't know much about it but even the even the way that the cover art is done to me speaks so much of the implicit frames and narratives we have and and this is you know the the, the cover almost represents a, the the subtraction the subtraction story that's been used about christianity so so here i am this pastor of a of a tiny little church who started making videos and and now i'm i'm not taking any psychedelics and i don't have any plans to but but thinking about psychedelics and and all this crazy stuff and yeah yeah the road goes on and on down from the door where it goes now far ahead the road has gone and i must follow if i can to to take a line from 
from Richard Mao that he gave at the Christian Reformed Church's 500th, where he quoted Hendrik de Kock, um, not Hendrik de Kock, um, I forget which de Kock, from the, from the Offskiting. Now you're getting into really murky, obscure Dutch church history, where this, where this, this local church pastor was, was jailed because he refused to follow some of the modernist um, commandments of the of the state church of the Netherlands, and this split then became part of the the trickles that be, that through immigration became the Christian Reformed Church. But one of the one of the mottos of of that man in jail was follow that lamb wherever he goes, and and that's what Christians must do. We must follow the lamb. Yet, boy, the roads take you in strange places. So early on in the Jordan Peterson thing, I found this video because John Verveke's name had come up in a bunch of different places, and I watched a little bit of it then, and nothing really grabbed me. One of the things that I've learned is that so often I keep circling around to things back again because I'm not the same person I was six months or a year ago or a year and a half ago. I've learned a lot, and the, I've gone down the road, and things have changed. So often when I come back and I listen to the same video, no, obviously it's the same video, it's a different video, not because the video has changed, but because I'm, I've changed. And so that's also part of the reason that I read too many books at once, and and, and then the books come together in my mind in different angles, and they mix, and I see different insights from them, and I'm always gaining new ideas and gaining new insights. And so I just listened to this video a couple of days ago and I commented and I did a blog post about it and I commented on it. And it, it was it was just so much fun to listen to because of course, gosh, how much time haven't I given Jordan Peterson over the last two years of my life thinking about him and watching him and listening to him and, and my consciousness committee just absorbing all kinds of things about him. And here he is in 2015 and it's before his carnivore diet and he's he's got quite a bit more weight and it's before his status rocket ride. And, and so he's kind of relaxed and just freewheeling and interrupting and, and doing all that, do that, all that um, you know, pre-status rocket stuff Jordan Peterson would do, and it's just a fun video. And and Verveke is there trying to trying to deal with the fact that the moderator here is is lower status than both of them, so he can't really corral Jordan. And say, okay, Jordan, you be quiet for five minutes and let John speak. And but it, it's a it's a delightful conversation, and Verveke is. You know, everybody's got a good spirit about them in the conversation, and Verveke is generous with with letting Jordan be Jordan. But Verveke's trying to get his points in, and so, you know, I've been paying more attention to Verveke, and I think it's quite the quite the um, the thing that University of Toronto has two such uh, amazing professors, and it's a shame. It's it's the loss of University of Toronto that you know they they handled the Jordan Peterson stuff so poorly. Now it's the Jordan Peterson, of course, uh, his book was released in January 2018, 12 Rules for Life, and his timing couldn't have been better, and so he's on this 18-month book tour, which is not really a book tour, it's more of an evangelistic crusade, and he's, there's uh, Jordan J JBP Daily that I signed on for, I don't know if I'm going to keep on to that. I was, I was hoping there would be more videos from the book tour, but I don't know... I don't know if those, you know, I've, I've been to two of the book tour events, one in Sacramento and one in San Jose, and I'm still trying to get my head around that whole thing to figure out what it means. And basically, my, my point is that Peterson, there's been a lull of YouTube content coming out from Peterson. Now, I just did a new one with with um, with a general who... So Jordan Peterson is is clean up your room, and the, the general says, make your bed. So I haven't watched that video yet, but I probably will. But in one of the first comments on that video was, um, oh, Jordan, I thought you'd abandon YouTube because he's been on a status rocket ride, and he's traveling all over the world, and he's doing these nightly shows. And, you know, if I had that kind of, you know, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to criticize his decision to go that way. But it is different from YouTube, and I'm still trying to figure out what to make of it and, and evaluate it. But but my, my basic point is that Jordan hasn't been putting out the kind of content that he did, let's say, when he was doing the, the biblical series weekly and then monthly. Now, 
there's a lot of question as to whether he'll ever do the biblical series again. He says November 2019, and I think he's in, well intended on, on planning to do that. I The thing is with him and the, the crazy things, you know, the reason I coined this term status rocket for him, because that's it, and rockets can kind of go like this, and it's it's... Part of what makes him fascinating to watch is the Truman Show effect of this. Where, where is he going? What is going to happen to him? We have no idea. Planning this poor guy's life, who knows where he's going to be and what he's going to do. The the book tour has been the most uh, predictable thing. And this, you know, Owen Benjamin's hated CAA has been, you know, lining all this stuff up, stuff up for him. So we'll see where all of this goes. But in the meantime... You, know, you notice that a lot of the people who who follow Jordan Peterson, well, they're they're YouTubers and they're coders and they're stay-at-home moms and they're stay-at-home dads and they're truck drivers and they're uh, retired people and they YouTube. Someone made the comment on Twitter the other day that I've replaced Rush Limbaugh. Um, this woman grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh on her father's radio. Now her kids are growing up listening to me, and I just think. What a crazy, crazy world. But that's that's sort of what YouTube is. It's disrupting AM radio and daytime TV. So people tell me they sit down with their kids and, and watch Paul Vanderclay. And I think, oh, those poor kids. <laughs> so people are looking around for new content. And Verveke's out there. And it's it's interesting because in many ways he's he was kind of mining a parallel track to Jordan Peterson they're both working on this meaning question now we're deeply within the secularist assumption the iron box of secularism and and the question that I have as I, I work through this stuff and again I've been interested in this stuff for years uh, reading Charles Taylor's a secular age which is a monster of a book a um, number of years before, far easier book to read, really an amazing book, uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. What's the relationship between meaning and metaphysics? That's, that's really what we're trying to get down to. And, and in many ways, in the secularist, the secularist assumption keeps us in this box. And if you're teaching in a public university, the as opposed to, let's say, a Christian college, in a public university, you have to maintain the the discipline of the box whether or not you're a maybe you're a christian at home or maybe maybe you have some other metaphysical beliefs that you talk about on the side but on the in the public stage in order to have a certain status and to receive a certain receive a certain welcome you have to maintain the secularist assumption and and that then it's interesting because when we get into the meaning conversation well how does that change what meaning is is it sufficient to have mere to have the mere feeling of meaning and i'd always notice that whenever the sacramento freedom from religion uh organization would put up billboards at easter and you know what it, what it costs to put up a billboard that's no small thing putting up billboards it costs serious money um god free happy and inspired by wonder and so the idea is that there, there doesn't it doesn't matter if there's a metaphysic it doesn't matter all of those things don't matter at all i can have the experience of meaning meaning is a feeling all right but once you locate meaning on the feeling level, the rest of your consciousness committee starts to starts to get uncomfortable, starts to feel some dissonance. Why? Because that's not what meaning longs to be. Meaning is is a wild animal and it longs to be free and and we beg for it to connect at a much deeper level. Is meaning not just built into us, but also built into the world? Now this gets philosophically complicated and this gets into Jordan Peterson trying to heal the split world because when you get into philosophy and phenomenology, you might say, well, all we have access to are, are our representations. And I was having that conversation with, with Adam on Twitter this morning. So, you know, we can't, we can't get beyond these representations. We can't even get beyond what is out there. And, and then suddenly we're kind of not only in this iron box of, of this iron box of secularism, but we're within this cocoon of phenomenology and and can we talk about what is out there and of course by then you're 
you're sucked into the grand river of philosophy and, and that huge conversation. But most people are not philosophers. And and most people are, are they're just living. And you can have all these little rules about what you're allowed to think and what you're not allowed to think. And people, quite frankly, won't care. They're going to think what they want and think what they will. And, and it's usually within the, the realm of social constraint that they, they clip their wings and they, and they frame their conversations. And they say, well, we'll talk about meaning, but we can't really talk about whether or not meaning goes all the way down. We can't really we can't really go there but something deep inside of us longs for meaning to in fact st stretch out to the the to to all that there is we we simply meaning itself begs for it to connect with absolutely everything I was I was talking to and again it depends on whether this person wants you know wants to release this video. I thought it was a good conversation I had with him yesterday. But you know I mentioned the book of Ecclesiastes. So again in in March 30 in Melbourne St. James Cathedral I think it is I'll have to look it up. Um sorry organizers. I'm I'm going to do a video with far more details about what's happening March 30 in Melbourne. They're going to put up a website so I'm going to Australia and I'd be in Melbourne and and part of, since I'm doing it in a church, we're going to frame it a bit with the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you don't know much about the Bible and have never read the Bible, read the book of Ecclesiastes. You'll really enjoy it, especially if you're following the Jordan Peterson thing. Because here you have, um, here you have, depending on which translation you read, Koalath or the king, the, um, and, and he's an alpha male and he's done everything and, and nothing's been, he, he's had the opportunity to taste everything that there is under the sun. And, and then you have in chapter three this this beautiful poem. There's a time to live and a time to die. Beautiful poem. And then in the few verses after that, God has placed eternity in our hearts. Well, what does that mean? And, and that's directly tied to meaning that that something in our hearts longs for eternity. And I think that is what the that that is what the sense of meaning is. We we long to be relevant. We long to know that our lives mean something. And as Viktor Frankl noted, um and, and others, that those in the concentration camps and the Nazi death camps, if they if they knew that there was meaning that the death camp couldn't touch, they could survive that. And and that's how we are. And that's how, you know, it, it's it's by meaning that we survive the the sufferings of this world and and so to to tell us that meaning is merely a feeling is a betrayal of the word meaning we our hearts our hearts won't take it and and to live in that box it, it it's ironic that the you know as victor frankel noted the those who had those who were victim of the Nazi concentration camps with meaning in their heart, they could survive it. But but people today and in the most affluent, comfortable, choice-laden places of the world within the concentration camp of secularism find it so find it so grindingly nihilistic that, that they don't see any reason to live. Now, now, if you begin to realize the stark contrast of those two frames, you should have an insight into what a human being is and why this is important. And then suddenly the journey from, from Sam Harris to Jordan Peterson isn't all that mysterious. And the, the status rocket ride of, of Jordan Peterson isn't all that mysterious. We, we can't live in the suburbs of San Jose, which when I was doing a sermon on, on, on suicide noted, you know, there was a suicides going ep epidemics, you know, there's a suicide epidemic going around in one of the most wealthiest, highest status areas of the United States. While when I ministered to Haitians in the Dominican Republic, living in desperately poor places, I, I never once heard of a suicide. Well, why is that? Because we blithely imagine in America today that our happiness is a function of, an, our, of our material welfare or the amount of choice that we have over our body and our capacity to secure our immediate desires when you compare people who have 
on the scope of human history had about as much opportunity and choice and affluence as anyone in human history and compare that to people at the absolute at, at near the bottom of that same pile those Haitians who are cutting cane and picking coffee as illegal immigrants in the Dominican Republic the Haitians have meaning <laughs> and the Americans do not Jesus has very interesting things to say in the Sermon on the Plain about about blessed are the blessed are the poor and, and woe to the rich. Well, you see that happening now. Americans who who have, you know, we have we have the internet and we have air travel and we have any food we want and and we have any movie we want and we can spend our days binging on Netflix and 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 computer games. Well, as we get into the the John Verveke video, yeah, why are we binging on? stories and games because we're we're starving for meaning and we're starving for meaning because of our affluence that offers that that imagines that choice offers meaning only to realize that some of the people in the world with zero choice at all experience far more meaning in the suffering of their lives than fat happy north americans it's crazy it's just crazy but there it is. And, and that's why meaning is wild. It will not be contained. You say, well, I experience meaning too. Well, that's why that's why Bilbo's road out of Bag End beckons us. And, and Tolkien knew what he was doing when he wrote The Lord of the Rings. That, you know, why I as a child in junior high, I read The Lord of the Rings for the first time, just completely fell in love with that, that book and its world and... You know, ah. <laughs> on with the video. So, so when I got into Jordan Peterson, I knew I needed a companion. And if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's *The Great Divorce*, C.S. Lewis had a guide through um, had a guide through the the foothills of of heaven, and his guide was. Um, um, was was McDonald's was George George McDonald and and so I figured that when I was going to start my Jordan Peterson Odyssey and I was going to step out of Bag End, uh, the Bag End here on Florin Road in my little office on at Livingstone's Church, I wanted a companion, I wanted a guide, and so I picked C.S. Lewis. Now now C.S. Lewis, um, of course, was a, was an ardent Platonist. If you if you read him, if you read enough of him. And of course, Nietzsche has the question, is Christianity just Platonism for the masses or Platonism for dummies? Um, C.S. Lewis, of course, said, we are only living in the shadow lands. And, and the book of C.S. Lewis's where this comes out most clearly is, I think, the, the last of the Narnia Chronicles in The Last Battle. It's, it's probably my favorite book of the Narnia Chronicles. And someone keeps recommending this book about uh, C.S. Lewis and the Heavens and Meaning, and, and I've got that book and I've started reading it. That's one of those books that I've been reading, Paul and skyrocketed up to the top, but it's it's on my list and I'm going to read it. But C.S. Lewis's point, of course, C.S. Lewis trod this road. C.S. Lewis's mother died when he was seven, and his father was not emotionally capable of filling the shoes of his mother for what he needed. And, and C.S. Lewis, of course, grew up in a series of bad boarding schools. And 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 along the way, now this these were, you know, North Northern North Ireland, that's where he grew up in North Ireland, and then and then over to England. And of course, at that point, end of the nineteenth, early twentieth century, these boarding schools were all formally Christian, uh, Christendom at the height of the British Empire. But but C.S. Lewis gave it all away, he didn't believe it, became an atheist, and you know, looked around, you know, went to World War I, um, had exactly the right kind of wound that would take him out of battle, but he would survive the war and his friend Patty didn't. Again, if you want to read a, a good biography of C.S. Lewis, I recommend Alan Jacobs' The Narnian. There are lots of good biographies of C.S. Lewis and different biographies. Um, fulfilled different needs in telling the story of, of C.S. Lewis, but I, I really recommend Alan Jacobs' The Narnian. And, and so Lewis, of course, you know, he becomes he becomes an Oxford Don. He's 
you know, teaching English. He's a, he's a tutor for students. And, and through Tolkien and Dyson and others, he converts and becomes a Christian. Well, why does he become a Christian? You know, he from his boyhood on, he longed, he, he loved Norse mythology, and he loved mythology of every kind. And he knew, you know, he knew all these ancient languages. And so he read everything from the classical period in the original, and he had the kind of mind that he could remember all of it. And so he loved mythology. And, and you know, Arthur Greaves is one of his best friends growing up. You know, he and he and Arthur Greaves became fast friends because they loved this stuff. And of course, when when Lewis is at Oxford, he's going to he's going to run into Tolkien. And of course, Tolkien loves this stuff. And and they had this group called the Inklings, and they would sit and they would share their writings. And and poor Tolkien had no stomach for Narnia because oh, Lewis is Lewis is like a child pulling all of his toys together and playing with Iron Man and 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 dinosaurs and it just put put them all together in his little box lewis actually did this with warning you can read about that in his biographies of course tolkien that was horribly undisciplined and it, it bothered tolkien but lewis just loved tolkien's work and so there at the inklings lewis would continue to encourage tolkien on to to write that book and write that book because of course it was, it was crazy tolkien basically reinvented fantasy literature and brought it into the modern world but no one no one knew we would have appetites for it now of course looking back we realize that's that's all we have appetite for because this world can be so starved of meaning so you know tolkien comes in first with the hobbit and then the lord of the rings and Tim Keller, who I've mentioned in a bunch of my videos, Tim Keller also knows a ton about Tolkien. And one of the comments Tim Keller made was that he, he reads Tolkien almost continually. And, and for a Christian, that basically means is that for, for C.S., for, um, for Tim Keller, who's also a huge C.S. Lewis fan, Tolkien is, you know, is practically reading devotions. It's, it's almost reading the Bible. Same for Peter Kreeft. And, you know, no wonder I, I gravitate towards some of these um, you know, Kreeft and, and Keller are both, you know, a bit older, older than me, 10 to 20 years older than me, but both of them huge Lewis fans and huge Tolkien fans. And you can find plenty of their stuff on, on Lewis and Tolkien, but, but Tolkien writes this fantasy literature and it's just, it, it just grabs the world. And of course, in the, in the 20th century, there were these, uh, there were these at the end of the 20th century, these, you know, what's the most important book of the 20th century? And, and they did popular polling, and Tolkien kept winning, and this kept bothering a lot of the uh, a lot of the English scholars. But the last battle, um, we hunger for real things. What does that mean? And, and again, when we're we're talking about this word "real," well, what is what do we mean by "real"? I'm going to read a little bit from from the last battle. I see, she said at last. I see now. The garden is like the stable. It's far bigger inside than it is outside. And you can find that in Doctor Who, and you can find that in Harry Potter, that tent that the that the that the trio use. It's it's bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. Of course, daughter of Eve, said the fawn, the further up and the further in you go, the bigger everything gets. The inside is larger than the outside. Lucy looked Looks, Lucy looked hard at the garden and saw that it was not really a garden, but a whole world. And, and here, don't we have that experience? You look at a garden and you start looking into the garden. I was reading, again, Poland, 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 Michael Poland. You know, he was on, he was on some, some, he had made some mushroom tea and then he went out to his writing house and he was looking at the garden and it was, it was more than a garden. It's a whole world. And, and you don't need to be on magic mushrooms for that. Just sit quietly in a field, and watch the, and and watch the watch the dragonflies and watch the ants and and just pay attention. You see that, yeah, garden is low resolution. It's a it's a whole world, and and the world is bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. Lucy looked hard at the garden and saw that it was not really a garden but a whole world with its own rivers and woods and sea and mountains, but they are not strange. She knew them all. I see, she said, this is still Narnia, and a more real and more beautiful Narnia down below, just, at, just as it is more real and more beautiful than the Narnia outside the stable door. 
I see world within world, Narnia within Narnia. Yes, said Mr. Tumnus. Now remember, Mr. Tumnus is her friend. Mr. Tumnus was who Lucy met on the other side of the wardrobe. Yes, said Mr. Tumnus, like an onion, except that as you continue to go in and in, each circle is larger than the last. And Lucy looked this way and that, and soon found that the new and beautiful thing that happened to her. Whatever she looked at, however, far away it might be, once she had fixed her eyes steadily on it, became quite clear and close as if she were looking through a telescope. She could see the whole southern desert and beyond it the great sea of Tashban. To eastward she could see Ker Paravel on the edge of the sea and the very window of the world that had been once her own. And if you know anything about Lewis's life, you just know that this is... This is the child Lewis, now with the capacity of an, an adult author, with immense power and knowledge, writing for him the story he always wanted to read as a child. He sees a new world, and he's sharing that world with us. And we write about psychedelics and opening worlds, but isn't this what literature does? Yeah, but... You know, in order to really enjoy literature, what do you have to do? It's like the difference between listening to a master play the piano and becoming a master on the piano yourself. What does it take to become a master? It takes work and effort and years and discipline. It's, it's, it's freedom. It's freedom to. It's freedom to write. It's freedom to dream. It's freedom to see. And far out at sea, she could discover the islands. And again, if you read um, uh, Pilgrim's Regress, one of C.S. Lewis's early books, I, I don't think it's his best book, but some of these themes are very much in there. And far out to sea, she could see islands, islands after islands to the end of the world and beyond the end, the huge mountain which they had called Aslan's Country. And now she saw that it was part of a great chain of mountains which ringed around the whole world. In front of her it seems to come quite close. She looked to her left and saw what, what she took to be a great bank of brightly colored cloud, cut off from them by a gap. But she looked harder and saw that it was not a cloud at all, but a real land. And then she had fixed her eyes on one particular spot of it. She at once cried out, Peter, Edmund, come and look, come quickly. And they came and looked, for their eyes had become like hers. Well, how do your eyes become like hers? That, now again, through the psychedelics, in a sense, that's a, that's a psychedelic thing that you, through the use of this, this drug, you, you now see. But there are other ways of seeing years of discipline, of studying literature, years of discipline, of, of, of working the mind, um, now suddenly they see far off and and Lucy and Peter and Peter and Edmund they have new eyes why exclaimed Peter it's England and that's the house itself Professor Kirk's old home in the country where all our adventures began so I thought that house had been destroyed said Edmund ah now they're looking back in time well that's not a strange thing for us if you look into a telescope far enough into space, aren't you, are you not looking back in time? But can you also travel back in time? Not the time that was, but maybe the time beneath the time, the time as that time should have been. So it was, said the fawn, you are now looking at England within England, the real England just as this is the real Narnia, and in that inner England no good thing is destroyed. Suddenly they shifted their eyes to another spot, and then Peter and Edmund and Lucy gasped with amazement and shouted out and began to wave, for they saw their own father and mother waving back at them across a great deep valley. It was like when you see people waving at you from the deck of a big ship while you are waiting on the quay to meet them. Can we get to them, said Lucy? That is easy, said Mr. Tumnus. That country and this country are all real countries. All the real countries are only spurs jutting out from the great mountains of Aslan. 
We have only to walk along the ridge, upward and inward, till it joins in. And listen, there is King Frank's horn. We all must go up. And soon they found themselves all walking together, and a great bright, bright procession it was, up towards mountains higher than could be seen in this world, even if they, even if they were there to be seen. But there was no snow on the mountains. That's like there's no sea in the book of Revelation. It's the same symbolism. Remember the winter in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. There's no snow. There's no sea. What is what is what does Lewis have against snow? Nothing. Understand the language. Understand the representation. There were forests and green slopes and sweet orchards and flashing waterfalls. One above the other, going on forever. And if you read if you read the abolition of man, they were sublime. So Verveke's taking on the meaning crisis, and I've, I've really been enjoying his work. And he's, he's just, you can find uh, Buddhism and Cognitive Science that's out there. It's on its own YouTube channel, and you can go through those. And I don't know if this is the an update of that course. It's been fun watching Peterson because he, he videoed a bunch of his courses so you can see how his course changes. If you're if you're a real nerd into these guys, it's always fun because in, in a sense what we're doing when we're learning from these guys is we're we're tracking them in their thoughts and we're we're tracking them in their language and we're we're thinking after them. And what a joy. What a what a pleasure. So if you, if you want some more bite-sized things, uh, Think Big Animation, another channel, they jumped subscribers fast. Um, they, he's doing some really nice little summary videos. I never turn off my phone anymore. Uh, it's usually just telemarketers. Um, he's doing these lovely summary videos in of, of Verveke stuff. So the zombie one I used in a sermon recently a little bit of, and and so the axial the axial re, um revolution so so all these stuff so so that's a good channel too but but let's dive in i wanted to do some walking through verveke's video i've listened to it three or four times now and you know again what i do is i i'm reading this book by poland i'm listening to verveke i'm keeping trying to keep on top of all of my other stuff going on and they all kind of come together so let's let's dive in and do some listening here Oops. So if I were to ask you. Come on, you can do it. This played on a commercial in the New York metropolitan area growing up. So every time I hear this song, I always think of that commercial. It wasn't a particularly happy commercial, but it's a beautiful song. Welcome back. I'm John Verveke, and this is a video series on awakening uh, from the meaning crisis. So last time we were... Assistant professor, give the man tenure already. Come on, U of T. Probably a little gun shy after Peterson. We're beginning our historical uh, examination of uh, the origin of this capacity for meaning making to try and get a clearer picture of what it is. And today I'd like to continue on with that. We were talking about the connections between meaning making, enhancing cognition. Now, now the first lecture doesn't seem to be in this series, which I was a little disappointed about. So, but I understand that sometimes I forget, like last Sunday, I forgot to hit the record button on my sermon. And those of you who are following my sermons, you can still find it on the church Facebook page. And maybe I'll try and take the Facebook recording and put it on YouTube, but you know. And <clears throat> altered states of consciousness, wisdom. And we were talking about that in connection with uh, the Upper Paleolithic transition in which uh, human beings seem to have gone through this radical change which was not so much a biological change but a change in how they were using their cognition. Uh, we talked about important ideas such as cognitive adaptation and psychotechnology and we talked about how the Upper Paleolithic transition was probably driven by the way shamanism was a set of psychotechnologies for altering states of consciousness and right now it's like, yeah, you know, never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be making videos talking about shamanism and psychedelics. But here we are, baby. 
to cognitively exact the enhanced abilities that trade rituals and initiation rituals and healing rituals had already been uh, creating. <clears throat> and we talked about uh, the, the way the shaman uh, engaged in various uh, disruptive strategies to try and alter their framing of reality uh, because how we frame reality is both uh, the source of our adaptivity, our ability to find patterns, but it is also how we can get locked in how we misframe reality and how we are in need of insight. And when we talked about that in connection uh, to, for something like that, the nine dot problem. And, and again, if you go back to Buddhism and cognitive science, you can find some of earlier versions of these talks and, and go through some of that. And that led us to realize that there's kinds of knowing that are independent from the knowing that we capture in our statements of our beliefs. There's knowings about knowing how to do something what it's like to have a particular perspective, and what it's like to know something by identifying with it and participating in it. And I was starting to show you how the shaman's altered state of consciousness was also enhancing and altering meaning making, affording insight, and improving uh, the ability of the shaman to help in hunting and health care. And, and I found that interesting because, again, you look at it from, say, a Darwinian point of view where you say, okay, well, why would all these tribes have shamans? What, what are they doing? Well, they are, now as we get into this, they're going, to be, they're going to be reframing reality so you can look at reality from different purposes. But if, if these, this is again part of Adam who does Think Club and Adam Friended, his, his effort. As, as an atheist saying basically you have to understand that religion religion obviously had its had its usage because what if a tribe with a shaman what if a tribe with a medicine man what if a tribe with a priest what if a tribe with a with a prophet outperformed tribes that didn't have them you look at the ancient world let's say because when you say shaman you're thinking about different places of the world let's look at it, that early biblical context all the ancient courts had magicians as they were called you can find them in the book of daniel you can find them in egypt uh, the the court in israel you had these prophets going through so they're basically functioning in the same way Part of part of what the so so in the letter from the evangelical Christian about his experiences with psychedelics, you know, part of the things that he said was, you know, that, that there doesn't there there really isn't a we don't really have the category or the infrastructure to deal with those within Christianity. And I thought, yeah, that's that's true to a lot of degree. But if we go back in the Bible, and you know, we don't find we don't find Elijah taking magic mushrooms. But if you go back in the Bible and you look at the, the prophetic class um, and you look at Saul, um, Saul getting, you know, when the spirit comes down upon Saul and Saul is numbered among the prophets, you know, we're not far off from any of these things. And so then you begin to ask the question, well, well what are the functions of these prophets and priests in the ancient world? Well, well, they obviously had functions that we understand. In fact, Nancy Reagan understood it until Don Reagan put an end to it in the Ronald Reagan White House. But, but they, they understood it as, you know, trying to predict the future, practicing divination, all of these kinds of things. But, but what these prophets and these priests, even in the Is Israelite context where they weren't practicing, well, they had the Urim and Thummim, they were only practicing divination that was permitted by the Mosaic law the the ephod and the urim and thummim and then the, the word of the lord coming and speaking to the prophets but but what the function of these of the shaman of the priest of the prophet what they're doing is they are obviously looking at the world from different perspectives and in israel looking at the world from god's perspective and obviously you had the competition between the prophets of the lord and the prophets of baal and so on and so forth so so even though we, we listen to this stuff and we think, well, where is that in the Bible? Where's a shaman in the Bible? Well, look at the Old Testament prophets and, and look at the company of the prophets and read closely the books of Samuel and the books of Kings and the books of Exodus. And, you know, here you find Melchizedek and here you find Balaam. If, if you actually pay attention 
to the Old Testament, you will find that you, these worlds are not far apart and you can understand the function of a, a shaman in a tribe. And, and of course, or let's say a medicine man in a tribe in North, in a pre-Columbian North America. Okay, so, so these worlds are quite strange to us, but they're not that far to understand. And I think what Verveke does is really help us flesh out, well, well, what adaptive advantage did the medicine man or the shaman give, and, and how did they give that to the tribe? And obviously in terms of hunting and healing, when we hear medicine man in our nomenclature, we tend to think, health care but but obviously with just a little bit of digging you'll notice that in native american spirituality and tribes medicine men medicine basically meant you're getting in touch with the the bigger narratives that are governing the world now one of the things that i think he doesn't talk about in this video but i think you can begin to see is that you have a medicine man for a tribe and so this medicine man is giving a, re a representation of a broader world in this tribe what happens with these massive religions like like judaism and christianity and islam and well, hinduism is is really a family of religions and then buddhism is is that these stories get very, very large, and they can actually encompass different tribes. And, 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 and there can be many sub-traditions within the big tradition, whereas as the shaman, you know, he's, he's kind of working on the local level, but his world, his world never gets that much bigger than the tribe, and the tribe might not get too much, much bigger than a few thousand, whereas today's religions scale up to the billions, so... Two things that would radically improve survival. I want to continue now in talking more healthcare and improving uh, the ability of the shaman to help in hunting and healthcare. Two things that would radically improve survival. I want to continue now in talking more about that, and more about what's going on in shamanism in order to get more explication of this meaning making, wisdom, altered states of consciousness, different kinds of knowing, and how they're all interrelated together. Now, even when we say meaning-making, you have the question of, is the mind, does the mind make meaning, or does the mind receive meaning? Is the mind more like a computer that's working on things inside of it, or is the mind more like a radio that's bringing things into it? Now, of course, with our computers and our cell phones with radios built into them, it's both and but but even when we say meaning making we're, we're already kind of um bowing down before the box of secularism and say oh yes i will observe i will observe the public protocol i will keep my speech within the iron box of secularism meaning is made it is not discovered all right and that's why i introduced i started with lewis because lewis of course will say no we we don't make meaning, we, we discover meaning. So typically the, the shaman engages in practices that are putting uh, significant changes in uh, their attention. As we mentioned, there's often significant disruptive strategies, sleep deprivation, sex deprivation, uh, social isolation, the use of psychedelics, uh, extended chanting, all of these uh, dancing, um, all of these things are designed to bring about radical changes in the way in which the brain is operating. And again, that's part of the reason why I read some of that literature, because literature does this. Movies do this. And we're going to talk about flow states in a minute. But um, John Verveke's point here is that in order to see the world better and actually to be more capable in the world, well, what do you mean by that? To, to, to be able to achieve outcomes that are desired or at least to achieve experiences that are desired or to achieve change that is desired in the world, you need to begin to see the world from different perspectives. Jonathan Haidt continues to make the point that the reason we should value diversity is because Diversity allows us to know things from different angles. That's the purpose for diversity. Uh, the definition of an idol is to make a good thing an ultimate thing. Diversity itself is not the diversity itself is not actually the goal. Diversity is a strategy to achieve a goal. Well, what is the goal? The goal to is to 
as clearly as we can, as sharply as we can, to see what is. To have our representations, again, Don Hoffman, we, we use these interfaces, to have our representations get better and better and better and better in terms of closer and closer and closer to the world, the, the, this objective world, this real world that is out there. Now you can begin to understand, well, okay, from a, from a Christian point of view, why do you go further up and further into God? Well, if God is the source, and if all of these worlds are mountains out of Aslan's country, well, you want to get further up and further in. You want to get to real Narnia and real England and real Sacramento and real Paul Vanderclay, that there is actually something under here. And even though we're dealing with representations, we want those representations to get better. And you can say, well, science has a similar project towards this objective order that we cannot penetrate with a monarchical vision because of course we have subjectivity one of the most fascinating things about reading michael Pollan's book is that in the area of psychedelics you have this the question of subjectivity and and science really coming into clarity because once you have expectation and you go into a and you go and look and toy with these psychedelic drugs well you're just gonna you're just gonna you cannot you cannot help but have your experience be influenced by the expectations the the set and setting that you bring to it and and i think that's an amazing illustration of what i talk about when i talk about this monarchical vision what nietzsche talked about in terms of the view from nowhere we can't do it okay that's not how we are and this this desire to do so well it invites us to folly anyway Let's keep going. Now, part of what a shaman is doing is, I would argue, also getting into the flow state. Uh, so the flow state has become uh, something that is uh, discussed both academically and in the popular culture. It, it was made famous uh, in work uh, by Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, his book, Flow, The Flow Experience, brought it to the forefront in 1990. So what is the flow experience? Um, so the flow experience is experience people get into, they often describe it as like being in the zone. So you are involved in a task that is very demanding. In fact, it has a particular structure to it. So these are your... Hey, some nice editing here. Boy, they've upped their game since Buddhism and cognitive science. Pretty sharp. Or skills. And these is how demanding the situation is. Right. And the flow state is one in which the demands of the situation just slightly go beyond your skill abilities. Right. And so you can get what's called here, Csikszentmihalyi often represents this by the flow channel. Right. When my skills can just through, we'll talk about this through like sort of insight and restructuring, when I can just enough ex exact and extend my skills to meet the demands, so I have to put everything I've got into it, then I get into the flow channel. If my skills exceed the demands, I fall into boredom. If my demands exceed the skills, uh, all right, I fall into anxiety. Now, of course, the thing about you is you're very good at learning in situation. So you need a, a kind of context in which uh, your skills, as your skills improve, your environment also improves. So. Um, one of the things we've created in our culture, if we, we have created uh, flow induction machines, um, because what, what those uh, machines have are a situation where your skills are constantly improving and the, de the demands of the environment are constantly improving. And these skill induction, these, sorry, these flow induction machines have other properties uh, that are very important in them. There's a very tight feedback between what you do and how the environment responds. You're getting very clear information, and failure matters. It's like at least symbolically because you can die. And of course, some of you are probably realizing that I'm talking about video games. Uh, video games are one of the uh, most reliable ways of inducing the flow state in people. So he's going to start talking about the relationship between meaning and flow state because that's that's obvious and and. 
In fact, part of the reasons why video games are addictive and they're now being considered to be a bona fide addiction by the World Health Organization is precisely because they engender the flow state. Addictions, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about addictions, addictions run off machinery that is evolutionarily adaptive. That's why it's compelling. So, the flow state. What are other things that people do to get into the flow state? They play jazz. They do martial arts. I'm a martial artist, right? One that's particularly interesting because there's no other explanation for It's interesting because what, do, what are some other things that people do to get into the flow state? That's not why we do it. Or is it why we do it? Because you might not have ever heard that anything about the flow state. You give a child a little a little video game, a little Nintendo, and you say, the child says, Mommy, I want to get into the flow state. Here, have a Nintendo. Um, no, I want the Nintendo. All right? But so then there's this flow state, and this, this flow state is something that's terribly, it's, it's, the flow state is, is food for a hunger that we have. Well, what is the hunger that we have? Well, the hunger is, is, is meaning. Well, what's the relationship between the flow state and meaning? What's the relationship between flow state and, and this environment that we have? And I thought the graph uh, shows it nicely. For why people do it, other than they get into the flow state, is rock climbing. Because rock climbing otherwise would be like it's it's like some sort of torture from Greek mythology, right? You presented it like here's a rock face. What I want you to do is I want you to go up that. It's going to be really physically demanding. It's going to hurt you. You might fall to you and harm yourself. And once you get to the top, you come back down. It would seem like a, a, a torturous thing to do. Well, we know why people rock climb. They rock climb because they get into the flow state. And the flow state is deeply, deeply positive for people. It's not the same thing as physical pleasure, right? In fact, the flow state is much more connected to meaning in life. In fact, the more often you get into the flow state, the more likely you will rate your, your life as meaningful. The more, the more you will experience well-being. Now, it, it's interesting here because why do we binge on Netflix? Why do we play computer games? Why do we look at high um, adrenaline sports well it's because of this and it's because of meaning and we've said many times that we will we will exchange we will we will we will allow we will take suffering in order to get meaning and that's what sports is you're you're out of breath you're running after that ball boy we'll we'll see if uh We'll see if my friend I had a conversation with yesterday lets me post the conversation because we got into a lot of this kind of thing because he got into the Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson part of the conversation talking about soccer and, and Sam Harris just dismisses soccer as, you know, all these men, grown men chasing a ball and Peterson's like, that's not what soccer is. So soccer is, soccer is sacramental to much deeper things, Okay. It's sacramental to much deeper things, which is why and we get into the flow state. Well, we begin to imagine that. Well, what will what will the what will the the life in the age to come? I'm a, I'm a naked axial endorser. What what will the life in the age to come mean? Well, we're gonna we 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 taste it in this flow state, and you, you get a sense of of Lucy and Peter and Edmund. In, in New Narnia, seeing the other hills on the mountains of Aslan, and, you know, right away, boom, it's, it's dialed in right into that sweet spot. Now, what's interesting also about the flow state, and remember we're doing this because I'm talking about that shamanism is probably a practice for practicing getting into the flow state, so remember that, right? The thing about the flow state, it's a universal. People across cultures, socioeconomic groups, genders, language, environments, age groups, report being able to get into the flow state, and they describe it in detail almost exactly the same way. That's a universal. And universals are important in cognitive science. You pay attention to the universals because they give you profound insight into the machinery. Why do we want insight into the machinery? This is this is this is the move. This is the move that always gets interesting. Why do we want insight into the machinery? So we can work the machinery. Who's we? I thought I was the machinery. 
No, I'm working the machine. See, right there, and that little move right there, that's always where I, I see Brett Weinstein. We're going to transcend the assassin robot. Who's we? I thought, I thought we were the robot. No, now we're a step aside of the robot. Well, to get what we want. Well, what do we want? Well, isn't it what the machine wants? Well, we want the flow state. Well, again, read the last chapter in C.S. Lewis's uh, Abolition of Man. What's it like to be in the flow state? Well, when you're in the flow state, right, you feel like you're deeply at one with things. So, for example, I'm a martial artist, and when I'm sparring... Now, again, read Michael Pollan's book. What, what, do, what do the psychedelics get us into? What... One of the uni one of the one of the common things that comes out of the psychedelic is my sense of being at one. Well, we get that in the flow state too. Well, what what are all these things leading us towards? Oops. It's like my sense of connectedness to my opponent is really enhanced, and I'm really at one, and that comes with it this kind of spontaneity. So when, 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 a, when a strike is coming toward, my hand is just there. I don't sort of raise your hand now, John. It flows out of me, hence the word, right? And the block is there. And, and in fact, I've often made this comment about basketball players. If we, whether it's martial arts or playing basketball or playing almost any sport, the, the relationship between the you that is shooting the basket and the you that's thinking about shooting the basket, one of the, one of the great ways sometimes to miss a basket is to think about shooting it. And so then we have this strange question of, well, well, what am I that there are these multiple me's that are, that are doing this? And, and what tags can I use to discuss, to describe these different parts of me? The hockey player, the goalie, just puts out his hand, the glove hand, and the puck is there. There's this tremendous sense of at one minute. And then closely allied to it is this, right? At one level, you know, like the shaman dancing or chanting, that there's tremendous metabolic energy at work, effort. You're making, at one level, all this effort, but at another level, it feels effortless. That's this spontaneity. Again, it just seems to flow from you. Your sense of time is passing differently. Yeah, ask me after six hours of playing Civilization. Your sense of self is being dramatically altered. So when people are in the flow state, right, their self, a kind of self-consciousness disappears. That, that self-conscious, you know, we carry around that self-consciousness that, that's always doing this, this sort of thing. It's constantly sort of doing our autobiography, how's my day going, how am I doing, who am I, what am I doing, blah, blah. And it's also checking, how do I, image management, how do I look, what are people thinking of me, how am I doing, am I under the threat? All of that nattering and, oh, am I failing, how am I doing? I knew, blah, blah, and, and that, you know, of course, and that can get out of hand. And we'll, like, when you're in depression, you ruminate on all that stuff and it overwhelms you. But we all carry that burden around, it's taxing, and the thing in the flow state, it's gone. Because there's no space for all of that, because you're so, right, engrossed in the task. The other thing about the flow state is it's super salient. Like, it's like, it's like, like, it's like the kind of brightness and vividness you get in a video game. The world seems more intense and people really like this experience. And not only do they like it, it seems to be where they do their best work. So the flow experience is an optimal experience in two ways. Many people regard it as the best experiences they can have, but it's also where they're doing their very best at what they want to excel in. That's why it's so motivating to get into the flow state. So, why is the flow state so good? So, this year, 2018, I, I, I published some work with Adrian Herabenet and Leo Ferraro 
in which we try to argue for what the cognitive mechanisms are in the flow state. See, Csikszentmihalyi tells you the environmental conditions, what you need in order to get into the flow state. You need skills and demand to be matched. You need there to be very tight coupling between you and the environment, like in the video game. You need very clear information. It can't be ambiguous or vague. And failure has to matter. It has to be costly to you in some fashion. He specified all of that. He also specified the kind of training that helps enhance you get to get you into the flow state. And think about this. Think about what I said. Again, training. It's really important here because you don't, you don't just do it, and that's in a sense the difference between, let's say, a psychedelic or even a computer game. A computer game, well, computer games are really good at scaling. You start out as a newbie, and very quickly you, you, you improve. It's not near as much the case of, let's say, learning a musical instrument or, or learning to use a language or learning literature to the degree that you can, say, do and write like C.S. Lewis writes. That kind of training actually takes years and decades and hours and hours and hours of development. Okay. Last time, and we're going to explore this more, training in mindfulness. The more people have training in mindfulness increases their capacity to get into the flow state. Now, can we come up with a unified explanation for all of this? I think we can both for the phenomenology, why we're experiencing what we're experiencing when we're in the flow state, and why is it improving your cognition? And therefore, why would the shaman be enhancing their cognition by getting into something like the flow state through their ritual practices? Okay, so think about the rock climber, okay? The rock climber is climbing. Remember we talked about how you frame and find patterns last time. Remember the nine dot problem, right? And that these patterns aren't just patterns in your mind, they're patterns in how, knowing how to make sense of things. So you're rock climbing, and if that breaks down, you impasse, you're stuck. And I don't mean just cognitively, you're physically stuck. See, and, and this is a nice illustration on this, you know, when you ask me why why my last year and a half of working with the Jordan Peterson stuff has made me even more committed to the physical resurrection of Jesus, this is exactly it. Because that which is more real is more real on every level. And so to, to, to think that well, the resurrection is a nice metaphor. Yeah, it's a nice metaphor. It's an extremely valuable metaphor. This metaphor can get played out in how many different ways and can be used in how much different literature. But how much more powerful, and this is Lewis's point, how much more powerful is it when it's real? What if this is the myth? What is this? What if what if this is the myth that has become true? Because because this is what we want. You can play a video game, a rock climbing video game, but Everybody who plays a rock climbing video game, maybe not everybody, but thinks, I sure would love to have those kind of skills video game, uh, doing it in real life. Uh, my my kids were playing a video game with this dude. Oh, what was the name of those games? The dude was just, you know, the, the guy could just climb up everything. And you just watch him climb, and he'd shoot and guns and all this stuff. He's climbing up everything. And just watching that, that boy, I wish I could, I wish I could climb. It's like parkour on steroids. And um, it's a pretty, pretty famous video game. There's been a, two or three of them out. And you look at that and say, wow, I wish I could do that. Yeah, why do I wish I could do that? In fact, I get into the flow state just doing it, watching someone doing it, or doing it virtually, watching a YouTube on someone doing it. That just kind of gets me into the foothills of it. But actually being able to do it, well, now we're, now we're getting somewhere. In other words, the more layers at which it's real the better it is. It's just obvious. Now, if you want to be a good rock climber, what you have to do is you have to break that framing. You have to train yourself to break the frame, re restructure, change what you're finding relevant and salient, and then change yourself to fit that, and then you refit yourself to the rock face. I love this point. This is, this is a Great, great point. And for me, when he made this point, all kinds of things came together.
you refit yourself to the rock face. Then you have to do it again. And then you have to do it again. And then you have to do it again. Or the jazz musician. The jazz musician is playing. They pick up on a pattern. They play with it. But they can't stay with it too long. What do they have to do? They have to shift. They have to restructure. They have to shift into a new pattern and then play with that. But they can't stay with it too long. They have to pick up on it. They have to refresh. Again and again and again and again and again. Do you see what's going on with the rock climber, the jazz musician, the martial artist, is this idea of a cascade of insights. You're having an insight that's leading to another insight that's leading to another insight, right? It's priming. So, you know when you have like an insight, you have like, aha! And you get that sort of burst of energy and it's like a flash. That's why we put a light bulb over somebody's head when we want to show them having an insight. It's like that flash. Now imagine if I took that aha and I extended it. Aha! That's the flow state. It's an insight cascade. So the more you flow, the more you're training your ability for insight. And, and again now, now, to bring in Aristotle and his causes, to what end? See, so, so we experience this, we, we, ha we find this experience very meaningful, and, and something within that is begging us to say, this is from another world. This is, this is pointing to something. This is why meaning just as feeling leaves us so disappointed. Because there's, I, I, want to, I want to have this insight go, but I want it to go further up and further in, and I want it to become more and more real. So maybe I'm playing a video game at which I'm on my, on my, on my PlayStation. He's jumping, 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 jumping. But now, actually... I would want to actually be jumping, 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 jumping in not just this two-dimensional, faux, three-dimensional world, but to actually do it, to smell it, and to taste it, and to see it, and to be in the moment, and to be in the action. In, in fact, it's to me, it's, it's the reason the ontological argument, we, we, we can't quite see it working, but we also can't quite dispel it, because something deep inside of us knows that the more layers, the more real, and that inside our hearts are haunted by eternity, and we hunger for this to be bigger, better, more true, deeper in, deeper in. And again, C.S. Lewis just nails that in this section in The Last Battle. And, and our hearts long for this. In direct, interacting with your environment. Now, the trouble, of course, with the video game is the, the environment isn't a real world. But in the shaman's world, of course, the shaman's flowing in the real world, the real social world, the real ecological world. And, and now, again, the shaman is the shaman of his tribe. So you've got your, your 100 or 200 people, or maybe a few thousand people. Now these religions scale, and they get up into the whole world. And, and one, of the, one of the things that you see happening in the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that in the Old Testament, it's, it's a nationalist vision. You get into the New Testament, one of the things Jesus does in the Gospels is, is he transforms this from a nationalist vision. At the beginning of the book of Acts, the apostles ask, when will the kingdom be re restored to Israel? And Jesus pivots. He doesn't answer their question. He says, power will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And what does that mean? And then, of course, the Holy Spirit takes the Gospel out into the Roman world, and it starts to spread, and then suddenly they have to deal with the Jew-Gentile thing, and and it just keeps going. We've got eternity in our hearts, and well, the shaman, he's playing with this in this little world. What happens when the world gets bigger? But there's something more. It's not just an insight cascade that's going on in flow. That, that in and of itself would be great. There's something else going. This has to do with your capacity for implicit learning. Now notice what's happening here. Notice that although even I'm doing the history, I'm always also doing the cog sci. Because while I'll be emphasizing the history, the historical account, I'm starting to build what I need to give you the structural functional account. Okay, so implicit learning. This goes back 
Now, now I think he's going to make a point a little bit later, but the point about structure and moving and changing um, with the with the rock climber and so so there's the question, and this is a question that's haunted Christians. Okay, so you've got the shaman. Well, why? This gets really complicated. I got to be really careful. Augustine and City of God takes apart Roman paganism in a devastating way. But the, the question lingers, why did a tribe with a shaman or a medicine man or a nation with a priest or prophets or magicians, why did they outperform others? Well, I think what, what Verveke gives us here is an, is an insight into that that they outperformed others because the practices of the shaman and the medicine man and the priest, even the pagan ones, invoked new ways of thinking that allowed the tribe to see from different perspectives and that gave them an adaptive advantage against their rivals. And in many cases, the rivals was just simply the natural environment, it was the lions and tigers and bears and hunger and starvation and drought and rain and forage that the that the that the the practice of getting into this flow state helped the groups adaptively succeed and survive well that makes sense and it also makes sense in terms of well what is the greater goal well okay what does the apostle paul talk about in terms of the other religions in fact paul quotes in him we live and move and have our being which is which is coming from a from a pagan prophet and Paul appropriates that and says now well Christ is the he's the son of man and he comes and he raids Satan's house and God claims as his own all that is is his okay but you can you can understand the mechanics of this that Verveke is is pulling out and you can begin to say Okay, I can see lines of trajectory that are helpful for me. Now he's going to get into some of this tacit learn stuff, and this stuff is cool too. To work done in the 60s by Arthur Reber and a whole bunch of other pe people. So what Reber was doing is he, he was really trying to understand how people learn language. What he was doing was he was generating an arbitrary set of rules, completely arbitrary, just make them up on the spot, set of rules for how you can link strings of letters and or numbers together. Like the rule might be you can't have more than three vowels in a row or you have to have two consonants and then you generate you generate letter strings. Eight, nine long. These are so long that, that you can't sort of easily hold them in your working memory. And then this is what you do. You take, you generate, you can de generate an indefinite number. You generate a huge number of these strings and you just show them to people. Here's one. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. Okay, that's the first part of the experiment. Then you do the second part of the experiment. Now you generate a whole bunch of strings, but two kinds. One set of strings is generated by that artificial set of rules, and so follows the same rules as the first string, first set. And then the second set is generated by a completely different set of rules. Okay, and what you do is you mix up the first and the second together. And this is the task you give people. Can you tell me the strings that belong with the strings you saw before? There you go. Now, Reber originally thought what would happen is people would, because it, it seems like so random. What he found was people score well, well above chance consistently on this. People can tell you Oh no, those strings, yeah, those belong with the, the old ones. No, that one doesn't. That one does, that one doesn't. Now here's what's interesting. You now ask people, why? How do you know that? And they'll give you one of two answers. They'll say, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I just feel it. Which is, ooh. Or they say, they give you some explanation. They'll give you some rule or procedure they're using, and here's what we know. They're deceiving themselves or lying to you because that rule that they're using wouldn't actually predict their success. I, I wouldn't say they're lying. They, they just don't know. <laughs> and, and so they're making up an answer. This is what our brains do. We know this about our brains. 
So you are picking up, you have this tremendous capacity outside your conscious awareness, right, to pick up on very complex patterns in your environment. This is what I call your consciousness committee. And you say, okay, why? What does this have to do with shamanism? Well, hang on, because we talked about the shaman picking up on patterns last time. Let's go back to this. Let me talk about an experiment that's really interesting. So there was some work done on this idea, you know, that people have psychic abilities, and there's the feeling of being stared at. The people can tell when they're being stared at. And people reliably report that they think, oh, I knew somebody was staring at me. I could just feel it in the back of my neck and stuff like that. And so they ran an experiment in which they did the following. They'd have somebody in, in a room, blindfolded, earplugged, they can't sense anything, nobody's allowed to wear perfumes or anything. That person can't see or hear or feel, and they're just standing in the room. Unbeknownst to that person, a, an in, pe people would come in and stare at them. And then they had to report if the person at the center of the room had to report if they were being stared at or not. And people were reporting this well above chance. They were saying, oh, I think I'm being stared at. And there was somebody there. And of course, first of all, it's, ooh, right. But then it turned out that if you made a slight change to that experiment, it wouldn't replicate. So what was going on? You bring people into the room, and they say, I think I'm being stared at, and the researchers would tell them if they were correct or not. They would say, you're right, or you're wrong. So what? You say, so what? Well, here's the thing. The researchers thought they were introducing people, the viewers, into the room randomly. But it turns out they weren't introducing them randomly, because you know what's very hard for you to do? Random stuff. They were actually introducing people as viewers. No, no, even that point. Why is it hard for us to do random stuff? Just think about that. <laughs> think about that in terms of the definition of random. Viewers, they were actually introducing people as viewers in a complex pattern. And the person that was blindfolded and earplugged was implicitly learning the pattern because they were getting feedback. If you take the feedback away, if you don't tell them, whenever they say, I'm being stared at or not, if you don't tell them whether they're right or wrong, their performance drops to chance. See, a lot of what looks like psychic abilities are your ability to pick up implicitly on complex patterns in the environment without being aware of it. So, Hogarth, in his book on educating intuition, made a really, really cool, really cool claim. Makes a very good argument, in fact, I think, for this. He says that what we call intuition is a real thing, but there isn't anything sort of magical about it, in the, like the psychics, say, or something like that. We gotta, we gotta watch our, we gotta watch our, see, I'm a, I'm a Christian pastor, I have to watch, I have to watch the people in authority over me. He's in a secular university. He's got to watch the people in authority over him. And again, I'm not saying that to dismiss it, but it's, if you, if you, again, you go back to Dallas Willard's comments about how worldviews are, are communicated. And, and I see this in, in preaching too, when I ever do any preaching coaching, it's all these little throwaways that, that subtly communicate the group the group assumptions, okay, of course this is what we believe. This is our frame. That's exactly, that's essentially how the frames get communicated. Not explicitly, but implicitly. And, and you only really notice it if you're in a group that's a little bit outside that frame. And again, Jonathan Haidt's point, that's why diversity is so critically important and so helpful, because if you can listen to groups outside your frame, you can learn about your frame, because the hardest frame to learn is always your own. Your intuition is the result of your implicit learning. You pick up on all kinds of complex patterns, not knowing how you have done that, but you get an ability to detect patterns, and you don't know how. That's why your intuition feels the way it does. You just sort of know. Like, you know things, you're doing it all the time. To use a famous example from Dreyfus, you know how far to stand from somebody. 
and what angle to stand, like where you should stand, how close you should stand, what angle you should stand, how as the conversation or the context changes, you're allowed to move closer or farther away, what angles you're allowed to be at. But if I were to ask you to tell me how you do that, you wouldn't know. You would just say, I know how to do it. And yet, when people don't know how to do it, it creeps you out. It creeps you out. Okay, so intuition. Now, Hogarth points out, and this is something very common, right? Hogarth points out that, you know, we have two different terms and we don't realize we're talking about the same thing. We have intuition when we think it's going well, that implicit learning, but we also have bias and prejudice for when we think that implicit learning goes bad. The bigot has got intuitions about races that are wrong. Now why is, how is it that implicit learning goes wrong? Well, here's the thing. You have some complex pattern in the environment, right? And your implicit learning picks up on it. The problem is there's two kinds of patterns in your environment. There's correlations, there's correlation patterns, and causal patterns. So what do I mean by that? Now, this is, an, this is something that, like I said before, I, I hear things, I listen to this thing, I just listened to this video when it was first released, that wasn't very long ago. And this is one of the things that I picked up on and it's been churning around in my head. Causality and correlation. And, and we like to differentiate them. We don't really have a good handle on cause. We see correlation. And sometimes it's easy to dismiss them. But sometimes we dismiss them prematurely. Well, let's get into his examples because they're good. Correlations is what any two things are related to each other. So let me give you an example of a couple of correlations that you shouldn't confuse with causation. There is a correlation between how large your wedding is and how long your marriage will last. If you have a bigger wedding, your marriage will last longer. Now, you would be a fool to therefore think you should have the biggest possible wedding. Because the reason why bigger weddings predict longer marriages is not because bigger weddings cause longer marriages, is because right? They're only correlated. It's because bigger weddings reflect a bigger social network, more financial resources, and having a bigger social network for the couple, having more financial resources actually does cause a marriage to last longer. Okay, let's, let's look at this example because it's a good one to, to illustrate my point. So you've got the big wedding and we think, well, big weddings cause longer marriages because Maybe someone did a study, and the bigger the wedding, the longer the marriage lasts. And his point, which is true, is that, well, the big wedding itself doesn't cause the longer marriage. What he points at, what he points to, are underlying things, okay? A bigger social network. More people can bring more resources to it. You could also look at a whole variety of other factors. Uh, perhaps if you've got a bigger wedding, it shows that you actually, the partners within, one or both partners within the, the couple have broader social skills, have better social skills. And, and they can bring those social skills to bear in terms of dealing with the inevitable conflicts that arise in the marriage. And, and you can find a whole variety of what we, what we might call causes. But what makes that story interesting is that Implicit in the story, it's that, well, I want to have a more successful marriage, so I am going to have a bigger wedding. It's the agency that you bring to the picture that, out of which we have this idea of cause. Okay, I don't think I'm communicating this very well. We don't have a good handle on causation. We, we, we can see correlation. And so what we do is we try to figure out causation, and as he's going to point to in a minute, this is where science comes in, because we, we then set up experiments in order to replicate. Or if these are things that are not really something we can experiment with, we do these studies in terms of isolating variables to try to eliminate 
the difficulty with human beings with almost any experimentation is that well there's two difficulties one is that we are so enormously complex and there are almost always multivariable causes there's, there's so many variables in play the other is the, the problem of us being within this experiment which is why they try to do these double blind experiments and again this is exactly where michael Pollan goes with his with, with the question of psychedelics because you can't have a control group with a psychedelic study because that group pretty much knows they got the placebo yeah i took it but i ain't i ain't i ain't feeling any but but and then they talk about the fact that scientists who have never had the experience can't judge it but once you've had the experience you also are now no longer unbiased in terms of judging it and the the psychedelic question so beautifully illustrates the difficulty of the subjective when our goal is to eliminate it in order to find knowledge but why are we trying to eliminate the subjective in order to find knowledge so that we can be so that we can manage the cause so that we can determine the outcome but again in this whole frame at some point you have to ask who is we do you want to have a long marriage why people every year decide they don't want their marriage to go on any longer and they get out well well what in that what exactly then are you hoping for well i want to have a happy marriage okay you want to have a flow state marriage it's not exactly the same as happiness you want to have a meaningful marriage um and and right away we we don't know what we is we don't know what we want so right away when you're dealing with human beings and Nothing we deal with is uncontaminated from human beings. These are all the issues that weigh in. You know, again, his basic point is exactly correct. Don't, and, and you find this again and again, well, there's a correlation and causation, but cause is way more difficult than that simple distinction and the way we usually introduce that distinction into a conversation betrays. Here's another one. So, I, I'm old enough, right, and I was brought up in a, a religious household that I was, you know, when prayer was taken out of the schools. And of course, um, people were very upset about that. Taking, look at crime is going up as we've taken prayer out of the schools and things like that. By the way, crime hasn't been going up. Read some of Stephen Pinker's work. Um, but let's say it was. That's only a correlation. Because here's another correlation. We know that greenhouse gases have been going up steadily. And that's part of the environmental crisis we're going to talk about. You know what has been also consistently going down for the exact same time period? Caribbean piracy. Having pirates in the Caribbean and wooden ships with cannons and stuff. Okay, well, the wooden ships and can the wooden ships are really important here. And and again, this is another one of my illustrations. And he's going to make the point you can't reduce greenhouse gases by uh, increasing Caribbean piracy in wooden ships, ships. But if you went back to sail in wooden ships, there's a there's there's something underneath that's pushing this that actually both things share and so correlation and causation is a very tricky business that's my only point in this as that went down greenhouse gases went up now i hope none of you think that we could solve global warming by bringing back piracy okay but maybe by wooden ships that, that wouldn't be enough obviously but so there are many things that are there are many and yes in the comment section i will hear from the climate change deniers and um i've had i've had phone calls and emails from a number of you any patterns in the world that are illusory because they're only correlational they're not causal see the bigot has picked up on correlational patterns not causal patterns so what you want to do is you want to train your implicit learning to pick up on the causal patterns that are real rather than the correlational patterns that are illusory. Now here's what you can't do. You can't tell people to look for patterns explicitly. Go back to Reber's experiment. If you put people into that experiment where they're looking at the letter strings and you tell them explicitly what they're supposed to do, try and figure out the rules. Consciously, deliberately try to figure out the rules. Their performance doesn't get better. And which I think is a fascinating point. And I, I don't think it's a very different point from sit there and think about your free throw. Well, you might sit there and think about it when you're tweaking it and fine tuning it, but the point of practice 
is, we call it muscle memory, we have all these different words, but to get into this other state. That when I always tell my kids when they're driving, the, the hardest driving you will do is when you're learning to drive and, and basically you, you move that knowledge from your rider to the elephant. And the elephant's got massive capacity for this kind of thing. It gets worse. Okay? And Hogarth notes this in his book on educating intuition. We can't replace implicit learning with explicit learning because it is precisely by being implicit that it works so well. What can we do explicitly then? What we can do is set up the right context, the right environmental factors, so that my implicit learning machine will tend more likely to get onto causal patterns rather than correlational patterns. Now, this is tricky because, again, to bring in Jonathan Haidt's Rider and the Elephant, if you really want to tinker with your implicit learning machine, you really have to train the elephant and not just talk to the rider. And when I talk to people about, well, why do you go to church? Why do you worship? Why do you have a discipline of prayer? Why do you, why do you make these things repeated things in your life? Now, if you tell somebody, if you want to be a great basketball player, you have to practice. If you want to be a great violinist, you have to practice. Well, if you want to, if you want to get into a flow state, like for me at this point in my life, I read that part of the last battle and I just drop, part of me drops right in or is at least in the foothills of it. I'm, you know, physiologically, adrenaline's probably pumping and I don't know all the physiological things that are going, but I can feel it. You know, I, I, I'm just, it's inspiring. Well, well, why has that been? Well, it's because I've been training in this stuff all my life. And, and so many people have, have talked to me and they said, you know, well, I've, you know, I've been watching Jordan Peterson and I want to believe, but I can't believe. Well, that's because your elephant doesn't believe. And, and you're going to have to give some time for your elephant to believe. Now, sometimes things happen and you have a conversion that's just instantaneous. And, and I think that's part of the interest in psychedelics is that, well, maybe if I take enough psilocybin or DMT or LSD, that bang, I'll get into, I'll have this experience and then I'll, okay, well, you, you might have an experience and then you might change categories. And I, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not an expert in any of that. But so much of this is in fact training the elephant. And it's, it's, the, it's the repeated things over time that actually trains the elephant and reshapes this, this intuitive level of us. So I'll get good intuition rather than bad intuition. How do you do that? Well, Hogar says the way you would do this is the way you do science. You wanna control the context, right? Because what science is, and you know, there's a lot of uh, science. Look, look, science is a way of distinguishing causal patterns from correlational patterns. You set up an environmental situation so that you can distinguish the causal patterns from the correlational patterns. Well, what do you do? Well, in an experiment, first of all, I make sure that everything is very clearly measured. I get very clear information, very clear information. Now, I think this is a wonderful part, and everything he says here is true, but now apply this to your marriage. And say, honey, we're going to, we're going to set this up in our marriage. See how that goes. I make sure, I'm looking to see that, right, that the change in one variable is closely followed by a change in another variable. And also notice, and again, I'm not criticizing this, but, but notice, I think, is how now reason comes into where intuition and reason begin to play together. And I think this is exactly right. And we, we use them. And you know, I've been thinking a lot about reason. What is reason? Now, C.S. Lewis tends to think reason is more of a, an expression of, of you know, God's gift to us. It's also a, a correlative pattern. Re reason helps us see relationships and, and track. It helps us compare. So I change your drug dosage do your symptoms get better, right? So I look for clear information, I look for clear feedback, and in science, failure matters. You test a hypothesis and disconfirmation has to be possible. Failure matters. Now notice this. What Hogarth says is, well, what I wanna do is I wanna 
I want to put you into an implicit learning situation where you get clear feedback, like you do in science, where there is a tight coupling between what you do and how the environment responds, and where error really matters, like in science. And he says what we should do is we should try and do implicit learning in those kinds of contexts. Well, here's what myself and my colleagues argued. Those three criteria that will turn your intuition into good implicit learning are exactly the conditions for flow. Clear information, tightly coupled feedback, and error matters. The rock climber is looking for cl needs clear information, tightly coupled feedback, and error really matters. That context really means that there's a much greater chance that their implicit learning machinery is going to pick up on causal patterns rather than correlational ones. So, notice what we've got going on here. The shaman is getting into the flow state, is developing all these techniques for getting into like, this deeply immersive, comprehensive flow state. And they're getting an insight cascade. And they're also getting enhanced implicit learning. Picking up on very complex, real complex patterns. Now this is intuitive. They don't know how they're doing it. Now, now, it's also, though, that the shaman is practicing this within a tradition. That there's the shaman, or the religious person, or the priest, or the prophet, or the pastor, is, is working on all of this within a, actually a very long tradition. Because that's how they're getting into the flow state. And, and so it's important to not lose that contextual piece in that. In, in that it's it's actually again it's it's not different from training the elephant if you want to train the elephant listen to Jonathan Haidt you you work on the path and, and the wise rider figures out you know you train the elephant by managing the environment well how do you manage the environment well, what are the rules for managing the environment well these come from your tradition and, and so if you listen to Jonathan Peugeot talk about liturgy that's what he's talking about that over centuries the liturgy changes and and shapes the elephant okay that's that's how religions work here's what's interesting too these two are reinforcing each other because the insight gets your cognition to explore for new patterns and then the implicit learning picks up those new patterns and then those new patterns enhance your ability to restructure and then, right, you keep exploring for new patterns, acquiring the new patterns through implicit learning, and you keep ratcheting your skills up. Getting into the flow state is deeply, deeply enhancing of your cognition. Somebody who's an expert at getting into the flow state is going to be an individual you want to have around. Now, that individual is going to have some really serious challenges facing them. They don't know how they're getting a lot of the information they're getting. They don't know why they're so insightful. They don't, and they're, and they're experiencing this radical at one mint with the world, this loss of sense of self, when they're enacting the animal, right? You, you have to understand, these insights aren't verbal insights. Like in the nine dot problem, it, it, it's not words, it's not beliefs. It's getting an insight in how the deer moves. It's getting an insight, an intuitive insight in how to talk to this person, to trigger the placebo effect, to help them to heal right now. It's the 10,000 hours. It's Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. It's, it's all of that training that has gone on in this person. And now again, when you're looking at the scope of human history, it's all of these traditions coming down and doing that work. And they're all tweaking and learning from each other if they're connected in one way or not. Now, obviously, in our contemporary society, since the, since the, um, the Colombian... The Columbian Exchange, the whole world has been connected, okay, and increasingly so, but this is all happening. So, getting into the flow state, notice what's going on here. 
Notice you're getting something that's almost like a mystical experience. It's a, a powerful altered state of consciousness. It's enhancing your cognitive processing. And the shaman is making meaning. They're singing, they're dancing, they're telling stories, they're altering people's sense of what matters, they're altering people's sense of identity, they're healing and transforming people. Well, then that's, that's where making meaning, meaning he's making meaning for him or herself, or he's making meaning for the tribe. And I would say making meaning for the tribe, which means that what we do is we get meaning from each other. What does that mean? <laughs> Why would that have powered the upper Paleolithic transition? Well, first of all, this is enhancing your cognition. But, and this is, goes towards the work of Michael Winkleman and also Matt Rossano. What's happening in this state is your brain is learning to get areas to talk to each other that normally don't talk to each other. This is especially the case if you've gone through a massive disruption strategy, fasting, social isolation, taking psychedelics. Because what, if you look at a brain scan of somebody who's having a psychedelic experience, areas of the brain that do not, not, normally do not talk to each other are talking to each other now. Now, if I, if I was just to do that to you, if I was just to get areas to talk to each other, you'd experience that as noise. But if you've got enhanced insight and enhanced intuition, those areas are now talking to each other and you can bridge between them. You can connect them. And now this is an ability you take for granted. You think it is just the normal part of your cognition. This is your capacity for metaphor. And we go, he goes into a section here on metaphor, which I, I think is good, but I, it doesn't hold my interest because this is already known territory for me. So, and then he goes into the axial age, which is where I'm going to pause it. Well, maybe I'm going to pause the video instead of having you have sit here and have me search it. Okay, maybe I will play some of it. But partly because if you go back into the Jordan Peterson Sam Harris conversation, what one of the one of the one of the little tensions between Peterson and and Sam Harris has been about story and capacity and and so then Brett Weinstein comes in with this idea of metaphorical truth. And and I, I can't help but get the sense that whenever Brett Weinstein comes in with metaphorical truth, he's assuming that this is a second class truth. And this is exactly the point Jonathan Peugeot keeps wanting to make to Brett Weinstein that it's not a second class truth. Because the truth is we don't know anything apart from metaphor. It is so built into our language that, again, what I said to Adam on Twitter today, whether it's, it's mysticism or mythology or science, these are all representations and they're all metaphorical. You say, well, math, well, we can't appropriate math without, you know, w without these connections. And so well, let's, have, let's have Ravaki talk about this a little bit. I hope it's not too hard for you. Do you see? It's pervasive and profound. All of your cognition, this is work done by Lakoff and others. I have some criticisms of some of their theory, but the idea that your cognition is filled and functions through metaphorical enhancement, that's just, I think, the case. Now, why is metaphor so powerful? Because metaphor is how you make creative connections between ideas. So in other words, this is how we think. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get beyond it. This is how we think. Metaphorical cognition as, is at the heart of both science and art. That's Peugeot's point to Brett Weinstein. When the shamans are enhancing this machinery, they're connecting areas of the brain 
that normally didn't talk to each other and affording a massive enhancement in metaphor. One of the ways in which your cognition and meaning and altered states of consciousness come together is in how your mind, your in, embodied mind, is generating metaphor in order to make insightful connections. There's a deep connection between how insightful, how good a problem solver you are, and your capacity for metaphorical thought. That's why when somebody is facing a problem and they need to restructure how they think about it, we tell them to use an analogy, to think of a metaphor. So, this is the point. The shaman is developing psychotechnologies for altering the state of consciousness to get into the flow state. And that flow state... And I, I wouldn't say just the shaman. That's what the shaman is doing. He's the illustration here. Um, we are all doing it. The preacher does it. The prophet does it. The magician does it. The king does it. This is what we do. Now we use each other. And so the king will use, the, the chief will use the shaman, the king will use the magician, the king will use the prophet, okay? Is already making them more insightful and more intuitively powerful, but it is also making them generators of metaphor. Literally. And, and this is why, so why, does Jordan Peterson, in his use of the Bible, turning all these people from Sam Harris? Well, he's thinking, he's helping them think. And, and in many ways, Sam Harris, in the debates with Jordan Peterson, deprecates and dismisses this type of thinking. And, and I think implicit in, in what Brett Weinstein says is, is something, so, well, this is metaphorical truth. All truth is metaphorical truth, my friend. Uh, you cannot, you, you you cannot live in the monarchical vision. You can't get in. You contaminate the room. It's, you, and and again, back to the psychedelics. The thing that I, as I listen to this book, it's just Michael Pollan keeps making the point again and again and again. The the setup by which we have done so much discovered so much good work in science it's wonderful but it has its limits and it's interesting that when you get to the psychedelics this is where we really begin to see some of the limits and they're just they're just they just become obvious and this 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 is what Poland makes through the book the point he makes i think it's really one of the primary points in the book but i haven't finished yet Early providing people with the forms of thought that will allow them to connect ideas, such that making inscriptions on a piece of bone can track the moon. Carving this figurine can connect me to ideas of fertility. Okay, now, now we're getting into something very biblical, something very interesting. We're getting into representation and we're getting into agency and okay this is us wanting expressing colonizing and and so here now now we're getting into some stuff we want so, things we're seeing a lot of the themes that we're going to develop coming to the fore here how much right Let's go back to let's go back to the little idol. Now we're getting into this question of of a sacramental worldview because we see the patterns and we start to pick up the patterns and so we represent the patterns and by representing these patterns we hope to we hope to what we hope to achieve outcomes we hope to. Um, have our desires reach fruition, okay? And, and it's at this moment that, but I, I just don't have the words for it right now, but I'll keep working on it. This figurine can connect me to ideas of fertility. 
see and, and connect me to ideas of fertility. we don't just want to be t connected to those ideas of fertility we want to we want to master fertility and this gets back into c.s lewis's book miracles in terms of miracles of the old creation and miracles of the new creation those two chapters at the end where in in the biblical story what happens is that so there's this hierarchy and there's the maker which is god and there's the vice regent with is us and then there's the rest of nature and what happens in the fall is that we rebel from god which is over us and nature looks up at us and takes a clue oh i can rebel too and rebels from us and this is where you get this picture of the fallen world and and so the story of the bible is actually putting this back in order and and that's where c.s lewis gets into his the miracles of the new creation right now my hand is is in submission to my spirit now we use the word spirit here because we don't know what other word to use because spirit is me uh soul uh persons i mean we we, we don't even know what we are basically but from you know after i was born i started working on this and i've been working on this ever since and in fact it's so implicit and, and intuitive, I don't even think about it. And and I can do both hands at once. Ooh, look at me. But if I start trying to do something like this, you know, I so then I got to go to a Waldorf school and learn how to do this crazy stuff because my wife teaches Waldorf. But you know, anyway. So so I've been I've been colonizing my hands since I was a child, and you know, my mouth and and all of this stuff. Well, and now we want to colonize the rest of the world, and so well there's a representation and there's a metaphor and and if i if i if i can make this representation then i can i, I still got to post this uh, the last two weeks sunday school class on the church thing but it, but last week i was getting into the the question of you know uh, of of colonizing and if i can if i can represent this well, well then i can well then i can what what am, I, what am I seeking? What am I wanting? What am I looking for? And and what is the eye that wants and seeks and looks? And and what if I don't even know? I'm so disconnected, disassociated from this eye. So the shaman is weaving together, enhancing cognition altered states of consciousness and improving our capacity for making sense of the world, literally making more meaning. I'm still working on that. There's a section in, in Poland's book that I was, I was, I was listening to and I couldn't outline it, but you get into this meaning section in the book and if you have, if you're a hunter-gatherer group and you have a shaman, you're going to outcompete groups that don't. There's a reason why it's universal. There's a reason why the flow phenomena is universal. Because this exacts some of our most basic machinery, enhances it in a powerful way. Now, the shamans have a very interesting kind of experience. They go through this transformation. They often experience what's called soul flight, as if they've gone to another world and they're flying through it. This is the origin. I mean, think of how we've come to this. But this is the origin of getting high. And the shaman does this the shaman experiences themselves as if they're flying above the world. Why? Why would the brain generate that? See, see, and again, and this is where we get into this, this, this weird question of the, of the psychedelics and what's actually going on. Because, well, is the shaman flying above above the world? Well, the shaman seems to be seeing above the world. Or let's talk about. So again, I got into near-death experiences with that conversation I had a little bit. And, well, well, no, the shaman's not flying above the world. They're there on the ground. No, but here's the question, well, what is the shaman? Well, what do you mean, what is the shaman? Well, what is the locus of his consciousness? Now we're going to get into really, really spooky questions. 
because now we're 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 at the we're right there at this question of okay well when I die and they put my body in this box am I in this box well what am I am I a story well what kind of story am I well I'm a story with agency well what does that mean and and so then I th I'm you know the more I listen to if I don't think we're as convinced of the secular frame as we like to pretend we are in our settings where we're all keeping up appearances. And and that's especially true when it gets to the psychedelic conversation, because the psychedelics powerfully suggest that the world is not exactly as it should be. And so part of us is drawn to that because we deeply want it to be. But while we're keeping up appearances with each other, at least in the secular world, at least in the secular university, we've all got to play this game because if you cross that line, you will be censured. Well, because you will be, you might be one of those strange Christian people, and you go all the way back to the beginning of the of the mouthy Buddha, and you know, you've got you've got Sam Harris scoffing at the Roman Catholics eating the body and blood of their Lord. He's scoffing. Oh, okay. But then you take a psychedelic and you have this experience and then suddenly you're not quite so sure that this materialist frame is what it is. And then suddenly you have to ask the question, well, the, the materialist frame, if this, if, this, if this thing that we're all keeping up appearances isn't necessarily what it is, then what is it? Then what is, in fact, the frame of the world? Then now, now, now you're suddenly open to whole different ranges of questions. And then you start to grab, well, how do you decide what group you want to be? Well, sociology of knowledge, you usually look at that which is useful and that which is desirable. Well, what do you mean desirable? That which we are drawn to. What do you mean drawn to? How do I know what I'm drawn to? Okay, that's massively intuitive too. So this gets weird very quickly. Well, think about this. The shaman is getting a much more comprehensive grasp of more complex patterns, but they're experiencing it mostly intuitively and metaphorically. Where are you when you get a bigger picture of things? You're above them. Now, what's, what's interesting here is that we're looking at the shaman from within the secular box. And, and that's, yeah, no, yeah, I'm deeply secular. And, and there's really wonderful things to be gained from this perspective. So, gosh, this video's going on a long time. Deeply wonderful things to be gained from this perspective. And in fact, in some ways, the secular, the secular room makes a nice hallway for lots of other different rooms. But what we're learning is it's really hard to live in the hallway. Let me, let me go back to what he just said, because that'll... How when you but they're experiencing it mostly intuitively and metaphorically. Where are you when you get a bigger picture of things? You're above them. Okay, that we're talking metaphorical. But now what what actual what do actual shamans do? What do actual shamans believe? What do actual priests and prophets and pastors and religious people believe? They actually believe that they are in connection with other beings, other agents, agents that have more power. And, and this is where, again, it's that line that secularism really fears because, you know, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris are talking, 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 talking through the debates. But then Sam Harris gets to the end of it and just, you know, I should, I'm not going to pull it up and play it again. I've played it so many times. And Sam Harris is like, well, what about prayer? When you sit down and you pray, and, and Jordan Peterson, he's working that line, and he says, yeah, but, you know, you sit at the end of that bed, and you really, really pray, and, well, then what? Well, how do you know? And, 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 and the line that we really observe is, there cannot be other agents that have power over us in our realm. We must be the top dog. I think that's psychologically motivated to be what is the desire and even the fear at the heart of secularism if if you know freud says that well we believe in gods because we're projecting our fear into the sky well secularism in some ways we're agreeing about our fear together and we say there's nobody here but us there's nobody here but us there's well maybe there's aliens but 
boy, I hope they don't open the sky and come down and destroy us. And then we make all kind of movies about that because that's our fear. There's nobody here but us. How do you know? Because the shaman, what was the shaman doing? The shaman was getting in touch with other agents. Why? Well, that was just metaphorical. Okay, maybe. Well, it was certainly metaphorical. But what else was it? That's that's the difficult question. And how do we often explain this even to ourselves metaphorically? Right? You you have oversight. Somebody who is in charge of things has oversight of them or has super vision of them. Do you see that? Those are metaphors. Those are metaphors that are little whispers, little echoes of shamanic flight, flying over things, getting, a, getting an intuitive, insightful grasp that is expressed metaphorically of a deeper connection to the world. Now, at some point we have to ask, was just the shaman deeply fooled? Okay, so, so theoretically we can say, well, the, exp the, the disruption of the old pattern, like with the rock climber, and the, and the getting into the flow state and having the new pattern, well, that gave them an adaptive advantage because they could pick up the patterns in the world. Well, is that all? Well, that certainly wasn't all for the shaman. That's not, if you ask the shaman what he was doing, that is not what he would tell you. Did the shaman not be aware that there were patterns in the world? Of course he knew there were patterns. But, but there is, in a sense, a dismissal of something by secularism based on our fear. We don't want there to be any agents bigger than us. Except we create these governments that are bigger than us. And then so that we worry about these governments that are bigger than us. But we don't want there to be agents that we can't control. We don't want there to be an author. Neo says it. I don't like to imagine that. I like to imagine I make my own destiny. That's what Neo says. Yeah, that's what it means to be an American. We're going to pick up on all of these themes as we investigate more the machinery of meaning making. Machinery, metaphor. Making, metaphor. But I need to move forward now. Okay, now it's going to go to the Axial Age, which is really cool, and I'm sure I'm going to talk about that, because that's I have talked about that before. That's really cool stuff, but that's where I wanted to drop it here. All right. Anybody watching Russian Doll? And I... I my wife and I went through the went through the eight episodes. Really good. I, I picked it up. I thought, oh, this could look interesting. It's a metaphysical second chance comedy. Might even make a whole video on this. Maybe not, because I don't know. Why do we love Russian Doll? Now, now, Russian Doll is clearly set in a much more Hindu frame, and it's it's not unlike Groundhog Day, where I don't want to give away any spoilers, but there are things they have to work out, and so they go through. They don't die; they keep coming back. They keep coming back, and there's there's actually a little bit more progression in Russian Doll than there is in Groundhog Day. Uh, Tim Keller called these metaphysical second chance comedies. They have happy endings. That's why they're comedies. Oops, I told you. Oh, there's a happy ending. But it's it's well worth the the four hours or so that it's going to take you to walk through to walk through this episode this this little series on Netflix. Why do we love Russian Doll? Well, we love Russian Doll because we long to live in a story where even even the rotation of the lives and the engineering of that rotation and how that works. There's meaning. And, and and again, we we live in a we live in a society that has been so adamant about pushing back against Christianity that well we'll take almost anything from anywhere else. So we're gonna take the we're gonna take the Hindu frame and we're gonna take the reincarnation frame. And what's what's kind of nice about Russian Doll is that it shows yeah you if this is your life you certainly want escape. But part of what makes the Russian Doll thing work is that consciousness. The, the character or characters that are in fact cycling through death and rebirth are having a conscious continuity, all right? It's not the case that, oh, somehow there's a thing that is me that, that there's no conscious continuity or memory that has been going through endless 
process of reincarnation and I'm trying to get to a higher level and so on and so forth. These people in these stories have conscious contact throughout their multiple cyclings. And so, in fact, they have a project that they are working on through their multiple cycling, cyclings and they're working on it consciously. But we're deeply attracted to this. And in fact, this was from Huffington Post. We're trapped inside Netflix Russian Doll and it's great in there want to live in that story it's deeply meaningful what's meaningful about it well we're making progress we're we're gaining insight we're into a flow state and we're 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 well what do we want to do now what happens is that the main character is trying to figure out what is making the situation work all right she's using agency what's what's the goal beneath trying to figure out trying to make that work well it's mastery because once she can figure out how it works then she can be in control of it well once she's in control of it then what i'm probably gonna have to do a video on the last chapter of of the abolition of man because this is exactly where c.s lewis goes the question is who is who is she that she is well, she's trying to fix her life, and she's trying to fix, now it's very psychological, she's trying to fix stuff in her past, and she's trying to fix critical relationships in her life. She's trying to fix her life, but what does a fixed life look like? How do you know? Because when you were six, you thought a fixed life looked like this. When you were 25, you thought a fixed life looked like that. When you were 35, you thought a fixed life looked like that, and you thought, if I could only have this then, and then maybe even you got that, and you realized, oh, that didn't do it. So again, we're mysteries to ourselves. So, okay, maybe we can get into the flow state. Well, even that, well, okay, play computer games your whole life. Get into that flow state. and Just stay right in that flow state. We look at someone who plays computer games all of the time and say they are wasting their life. Why? Well, they're, they're very deeply into the computer game, and they're certainly enjoying their flow state, and that certainly feels meaningful to them. We say, oh, no, but that meaning that you are pouring into that, that black mirror, that meaning that you are pulling into that black mirror is less than the meaning that the shaman was enjoying out there in the three-dimensional world, in the, in the world with, with hard objects like cell phone holders and like, and like staplers. Stapler by Stanley. There's a product endorsement. It's an okay stapler. We long for more levels. We we long we long to know. We long to we long for all of creation to be as subservient to our spirit as our hands are to our minds. This is why the secular age won't last. We will discard the secular age because why not? And, and this is why Sam Harris's kingdom falls because what he finally has is pride. So I was, I was talking to, to this young man and he was talking about how as a young man, he was watching Sam Harris and, and he was, well, let's talk about it psychologically and emotionally. He was feeling superior to all of these stupid religious people. Well, that's powerful motivation in us. We love to feel superior, highly attuned to status. And when we can do things that make ourselves feel like we're higher, we're at a higher status than other people, we feel good about ourselves. Where there's meaning, there's flow, there's, you know, there we are. And we love that, but it doesn't last. Then then it becomes known territory. And then we begin to learn things. And so and so actually what people get stuck on is just pride. Well, I'm smarter than those religious people. Well, congratulations you're smarter there's some people who are smarter and some people who aren't as smart there you go the subtraction story says oh only those primitives through the world are larger um, only those primitives thought the world huh, typo thought the world was larger and stranger we can reduce it into a space for objects once the world is merely a space for objects we find ourselves depressed meaning is gone and so we seek a flow state we hunger to live within the game, but we hunger that the game won't be merely a game, characters on a screen, um, other people's stories that we, we feed the brains off vicariously from Netflix. We long to live it. We long for it to be embodied at every level. That's why knowing how to really rock climb is better than rock climbing in 
Um, Uncharted. Ha, I remembered it. Thank you, Consciousness Committee. Um, Uncharted, one, two, or three. We long to live the game. We long to hunger. We, we want it to be, even if, as in Memories of Al Alhambra, I'm going through that one too, even if it was Juwan in Secret Garden. If you've never watched the K-drama Secret Garden, got to watch it. My favorite K-drama. Even if Juwan, he's you, he's someone else there. But even if he's, we long to leave Bilbo's door. We watch, we, we, we read Lord of the Rings because it puts us in a flow state and our, our hearts hunger for real Narnia. I was struck early on in Michael Pollan's book how often psychedelics are called a sacrament. Why? Because they, they seem to offer an experience of translation into another world. Okay? And, and, and that, that world seems to be connected in our world. Now, it's very interesting because he was talking about the fact that when some of the mid-20th mid century people who were looking for psychedelics went down into Mexico and found the people who had continued the pre-Columbian uh, practice of these psychedelic mushrooms, they didn't regard it as sacrament. What was sacrament for them? They were all Roman Catholics. They all went to church on Sunday. They all celebrated the Mass. That for them was sacrament. The, the mushrooms were, were playthings to you know, find lost stuff. They were, the, the mushrooms were for shamans. The sacrament was in the church. Well, why? Well, I think if you would, if you could frame it properly and ask them, they would probably say, well, the shaman is helping for local things. What we're dealing with here is the whole world. Well, what is a sacrament? Well, let's go all the, way, all the way back to Lewis. What is the sacrament? We are living in the Shadowlands. We hunger for real things. We are looking for the real Narnia. We are looking for a Narnia that will last. We are looking for a Narnia where there is, there is no end to the flow state because it's further up and further in. And, and, and in fact, you look back and you see it's Professor Kirk's old home in the country. I thought it had been destroyed. Oh. You are now looking at the England within England. The real England is just as this is real Narnia. And in that inner England, no good thing is destroyed. And they see their parents, the father and mother, waving back across the deep valley. If you read The Magician's Nephew, it begins with a mother's death. Is it Diggory? I think so. Diggory's mother. So we look for that real home. And one of the things I love about Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka, which is one of my old favorite movies, it's this little morality tale. The, ch the Basically in the story, the children sell out cheap. They could be masters of the magical chocolate factory but they sell it for dipping into the chocolate river or grabbing a goose that lays golden eggs or and what's what i love about the story that even charlie has broken the rules charlie is a sinner just like the other naughty children charlie is given the kingdom don't sell out for anything less than the kingdom c.s lewis makes the point um it's not it's not that we want too much that we want too little we're, we're like children who are satisfied playing with mud in the backyard because we because we can't see enough to know what a day at the beach is so don't sell out short want it all but make sure the everything that you want is everything